Thank you. Uh, I used to have another title, which you have already seen, but then they told me that the abstract will be published in the Bulletin of Symbolic Logic. So I decided to be a bit more serious. But uh, so I will tell you everything you wanted ever to know about infinitary logics. Okay. And actually it will be, an, as, as the movie, it will be an anthology of several tales and one epilogue. So we start with a tale of three logics, but we really have to make the upper bar go away. Otherwise it's really a problem. So how can we make a bar go away? I think this is because we share the whole uh, magic, magic. Okay, so what is logic? So let's start. Uh, start as a tale of three logics. Okay, this works sporadically. The clicker. Okay, I will have to use this anyway. So what is what is logic for us in this talk? We can be very fast in the beginning because this is uh, not uh, you know all of that. Uh, what is more important here? I'm fixing some things. The I always have a countably infinite set of variables, and I have at most countable languages. This will play a role at some moments. So that's one thing. I will use the bold FML to the absolutely free algebra of the formulas. No, of the I will use this to make evaluations and stuff like that and substitutions. Uh, Formalism, whenever I write phi psi chi, those are formulas. I will not even say that. When I write gamma delta, those are sets of formulas. Again, it will not be said. It will be assumed that the type will reveal it. And logic is, of course, a relation between sets of formulas and formulas, which is reflexive, monotone, enjoys the cut relation, and is structural. So for each substitution, substitutions, and the morphisms on the free algebra, or if you don't know those things, so just mappings preserving the structure of the formula. What is important, and let me stress it, because it's the talk about infinitary logics. So logic is finitary if proving something from an infinite set of premises or yeah, entails that it's also provable from a finite set of premises. Actually, at least this works good. So it's provable from the finite set of premises. Let me stress one thing. The rule of cut in this context has to be formulated in this perhaps a rather complicated way. And you cannot just say the usual cut with one formula. It's quite often you see it in papers that people don't add finitarity, but add only the simple cut rule, which doesn't work. If you are not in infinitary context, you cannot simulate the proper full cut by finitely many uses of, of a simple cut. So that's an important, and it's uh, good to know. Aha, but now we lost this, this, but we also lost the ability to move to the next slide. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, and intermezzo, uh, there were people, they are not here anymore, I think, speaking about non-compact logics and define them as non-finitary, which is quite often the same, but not always the same. So let me just uh, add this to, to make sure. So the set is consistent whenever it doesn't prove everything. Okay, we can discuss this longly, what consistency is here within this room, but let's not go into that just for the purposes of this. And logic is compact if the consistency of a set is equivalent to the consistency of all its finite subsets. No? And of course... Uh, not that often compactness is finitarity. To get from finitarity to compactness, you need a finite inconsistent set, because then, of course, you can you can you can uh, you can translate inconsistency to proving finitely many things. Then, if you are finitary, you can do that. But to do, do the other thing, you need much more. You need some sort of uh, uh, reduction of a consequence to inconsistency, like in the classical logic. But you know what what is needed for that? You need reduction theorem, double negation, and what else? Yeah, and the and the bottom and the false zoom. So this is a lot of things is needed for this to work. So it doesn't work in that many logic. So please, if you work in slightly non -com completely non classical setting, okay, that was wrong. In not completely classical setting, make distinctions between compactness and finitarity. These are different notions. Okay. Uh, we are infinitary, so axiomatization should not be just uh, sequences. So axioma, axioma, uh, so the sorry proofs. So proofs will be uh, trees without any infinitely long branches, but potentially infinitely branching, because there could be rules with infinitely many premises. The usual notion of proof, I think there is no need to read it. Uh, I will call an axiomatic system, which is just a collection of rules, closed under substitutions. I will call it presentation if it is an axiomatic system of the logic. So these are boring definitions for the beginning, uh, just to remind us and set uh, set the stage. One thing which will play a role at some moment note that whenever logic is finitary, it has a countable presentation. No, because you just because axiomatized by finitely many, I mean countable in the yeah. And I, I said that everything's countable, language countable, so it's countable. I will this is not other way, not always equivalent, and we will see an example soon of a logic which has a countable presentation, but it's not finitary. 
Okay, now finally some logics. The tale of free logic. So the free logics will be free variant of Lukashevich logic. And yeah, we will see if they are actually free. So first is the infinitary Lukashevich logic, I will call it. It has many names in the literature. Sometimes people call it just Lukashevich logic, and then there is uh, then it's not clear what they mean by it. It's just something given semantically by the algebra, so-called standard MV algebra. I, I use non-standard language for Lukashevich. I use non-standard language for the MV algebra. It doesn't matter. It works in this setting. So assume we have implication, conjunction, disjunction, and negation. We implicate, you know, the usual interpretation of implication, Lukashevich, one minus X plus Y. Uh, disjunction is the maximum, conjunction is not the minimum, conjunction is so it would residuate with the implication, so it's something a bit more, uh, bit more tricky, and negation is 1 minus x, and we define the logic as the logic of this particular algebra, so something which preserves the truth, so uh, phi is a consequence of gamma in this infinite logic, whenever for each evaluation, so evaluations are the homomorphisms from the free algebra into this algebra, uh, whenever all the premises are true, so is the conclusion. Okay, that's that's something uh, obvious, and uh, we have this logic, and this logic is not finitary. How can you see it's not finitary? There is this uh, interesting infinitary rule saying that if non-phi implies arbitrary arbitrary many conjunctions, then phi. Just look at it semantically. Uh, if you look at this conjunction, what is this conjunction doing? When you take one half and one half, you get zero. No, if you take any two non-one things, it gets something smaller. So whenever you take something which is not one and you just conjunct it, after some moment you get to zero. So that's that's why if you if it's not one, that this is at some moment zero. So one of this one of these premises is violated. So that's why this infinitary rule is fine. But in finite, no finite. If you have only finitely many, take big enough thing such that if you conjunct it long enough, you still don't get to zero. And this gives you counterexample evaluation to this. Maybe I should be pointing using mice, mouse. So yeah, that's yeah. I will see. So that's interesting. Uh, as a fun fact, this logic is compact. So it's not finitary, but it's compact. So whenever whenever uh, you have uh, that, yeah, because the set is consistent if and only if there is evaluation which makes it true, and uh, it can be shown to be compact now. And it can be shown to be compact the same way, absolutely the same way you do it for classical logic if you do the topological proof. When you take the topology, the power Tikhon of theorem, you know, the, the 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 continuous mapping of things to one, this is absolutely the same proof. Only the starting topology is not the discrete on the hypercube of one, but it's on this much funnier hypercube of uh, real unit interval. So that's fun. But OK, let's not have too much fun. Uh, let's go to the other version of Lukashevich logic, which is uh, usually called just finite Lukashevich logic. Uh, I will denote it L. The previous one was inf L, infinitary L, which is a finitary companion. Finitary companion AL is the largest finitary logic contained in some logic, but we can define it just usual way. So it proves something whenever there is some finite subset, which proves it in the in the stronger logic. So the when it comes to proving for some finitely many premises, these two logics are the same. From infinitary premises, they are not the same. This logic has an axiomatization with just four axioms and modus ponens as the only rule. And final logic, which we will which we will speak about, is, uh, I will call it, for the purposes of this talk, because we will see it only makes sense for purposes of this talk, hey, Lukashevich uh, logic, which is an extension of Lukashevich logic, by this rule, which was demonstrating the, 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 the infinitary one is not finitary. You know? This is, uh, uh, hey, I forgot the name. Can someone help me with the name? She studied uh, this, this uh, she has a paper axiomatizing Infinite. Louis. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For that. Yes. So, so, yes. So she has done this. And it's obvious. Uh, it is a proper extension. It's, uh, ah, there is some nonsense. It's a proper extension of Lukashevich, of the finitary Lukashevich. This we know because this, this is the rule is not true in, in Lukashevich. And it's not finitary because if it will be finitary, then it would be the same because it's the largest finitary logic. So it's a, so it is an example. Look, there are only countably many new axioms for each formula. There is sorry rule for each formula. There is only one rule. So this is an example of logic which is not finitary but still has a countable axiomatization, countable presentation. And what, of course, you can expect, we will show that there are actually not three versions of Lukashevich. There are only two because these two are the same. This is an axiomatization of the infinitary Lukashevich logic, which was the contribution of this. Okay, but so far we don't know that. So far we, so as far as we know, we have three different logics, and let's look at them. Okay, uh, 
as just so know that the, the things exist outside the Lukashevich logic and fuzzy logics or algebraic logic. There are examples of infinitarity in the same propositional dynamic logic. Now, when this definition of Queen Star has a repeated iteration, or in the common knowledge, if everybody knows that everybody knows, then everybody knows, then everybody knows that it's a common knowledge. And yeah, the infinite rules are essential, usually in non-classical setting. Usually in classical setting, you can somehow get away of this and you can somehow, you know, use some trickery to replace the infinite rule by something finite. But uh, when your underlying proposition logic is not classical, you cannot do it. So that's a problem. And why is it a problem? Because if you remember, the completeness proof usually starts with some sort of Lindenbaum lemma. No, and Lindenbaum lemma usually assumes finitarity. So that's why that's why it's the problem, uh, the lack of finitarity. Uh, yeah. Uh, so what is abstract formulation of Lindenbaum lemma? Whenever you have an algebraic closure system, so algebraic in the sense when something is in the closure of a set, it's in the closure of its finite subset, then meet irreducible closed sets form the basis in the sense that every closed set is an intersection of element of the basis. So this is an abstract formulation of, of Lindenbaum lemma. We will see it in more particular setting of logic later. Uh, some history, people were aware of this infinitary and were proving things. Uh, Schulholm, Goldblatt, Segerberg, you know, recently uh, recently another another group of researchers. And uh, uh, my entry to this is in the paper with Marta Bilkova and uh, Tomasz Lavička, the PhD student of, of Carles, when we somehow set up the fundamentals of the theory we are going to see from now on. Okay, so that's a little bit of history. So that was the fail, tale of free logics. So we have seen free logics, two, one defined purely semantically, one defined as its kind of finite fragment, finitary fragment, sorry, and one defined as an extension of the finitary fragment by the infinitary rule, which is actually the same as the original starting logic, but we don't know it yet. So that's that's the goal to prove it, among other things. So let's continue with a little bit of preparation, a little bit of abstract algebraic logic. It's a tutorial after all. So uh, we will see. Just a reminder, what is a matrix? Matrix is algebra with a filter. Algebra tells us how, what are the true values, how to compute the connectives, and the filter tells us what's true. Now, we define the semantical consequence in the usual way as a, as a, with respect to class of matrices as something which preserves, preserves uh, validity, so preserves being in the filter. Sometimes in the older literature, people speak about designated elements, but it doesn't matter, it's the same thing. So whenever for each evaluation, again, evaluations are the mappings from the free algebra into A, uh, whenever the, the, the premises are true, so is the conclusion, preservation of truth. Uh, particular matrix we will mention and use from time to time is this is this uh, bold face L, Polish L, which is the standard MV algebra with just one, because you remember how we defined truth, it was just preservation of one, and indeed, it is a model of the infinitary Lukashevich logic, and indeed, infinitary Lukashevich logic is semantical consequence with respect to this one particular matrix. It's trivialities, I'm sorry for telling you trivialities, but we built on them to get to non-trivialities. Again, that's something one should be careful about in this audience. <laughs> Our absurdities and you know, so. Okay, a bit more, a bit more of the fact. Uh, what is a theory? Theory is a theory is a set of formulas close under the reaction. Now, whenever you prove something, then it's already there. And, comp uh, and we have a system of all theories. And if we are not in the formula algebra, we speak about arbitrary element of some set of some model, some matrix, then we say it's a filter of the logic whenever it's kind of, it can serve, it can consistently serve as a set of designated true values for the logic. So whenever a logic proves something that it semantically follows. So it, you know, the, the that if you use it as for definition of truth, it makes sense. So that's a collection of filters on the given algebra. Uh, example, collection of filters on this particular 0, 1, this uh, uh, algebra of standard MV algebra of Lukashevich. Whenever you take the finitary Lukashevich logic or the infinitary version, it's very simple. It's only the, the whole set and, and one. There is nothing else. It's a so-called simple thing, but it doesn't matter for now. What is interesting, it's always a closure system. For arbitrary arbitrary algebra A is a closure system. As you know, the closure systems is what Linden Bonglema speaks about. And what is the most interesting fact, uh, which is easy, but uh, still amazing. No, not amazing. Amazing is probably too strong a word, but I still find it interesting after so many years that filters on the free algebra are exactly the theories. You know? So filters on the algebra formulas are exactly the theories. And this, of course, immediately 
gives you the first completeness theorem with respect to all, all L matrices. So what is L matrix uh, mod L? So these are the matrices in which the filter is the filter of the of the of the of the logic. So it's like the notion of models of a logic is like all possible matrices with respect to which the logic is sound. However, you can define them. In particular, you can take the the free the free formula algebra and the theory that will be a model of, of each logic. So this gives us immediately completeness theorem because of course, proving something means whenever uh, all says that phi is on theory, it's, it's in all theories containing gamma. No, that's another way how to say that uh, gamma entails phi. So that's the first completeness theorem, completely trivial. All logics have it. It's a tale of free completeness theorem. So let me tell you about the other one. And as, as before, actually, it will not be free. It will be just two. So what is the second one? The second one is that the matrix is too big. So we can, there is notion of logical congruence. It's a congruence which respects the filter. So it doesn't make things in filter and outside filter congruent. So then it's a logical congruence. And another interesting and surprising fact that always is a large it's such congruence. And for each algebra, that it's called Leibniz congruence because you know the Leibniz, no, the things are the same when they have the same properties. They cannot be distinguished by any properties. What properties? The only property we have here is being in the filter. This is the only property we can express. It's basically first order logic without equality with one unary predicate, if you wish. Okay, and the matrix is reduced when Leibniz congruence is equality. So there are no two different things which are actually have all the same properties. So that's the usual notion of reduction. Uh, this particular matrix of, of Lukashevich is of course uh, is of course a reduced matrix. Yes, because that's obvious. Uh, no, maybe it's not obvious, but trust me, I don't want to uh, say that. I mean, get into details. And it gives us immediately the second completeness theorem. Again, we just factorize. No, we have the counterexample. We factorize the counterexample by Leibniz congruence, and we get the reduced counterexample. So that's an elementary algebra. Nothing in So all logics have first and the second completeness theorem. So they are actually the same because all logics enjoy both of these forms of completeness theorem. Zach doesn't like it, or it's too trivial. Okay. 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 Well, we get to more interesting stuff. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, then we need uh, then we need a better completeness theorem, no? Because in in classical logic, in classical logic, this would give us completeness with respect to all Boolean algebras with filter being a singleton interval. This will be the reduced models of classical logic. So all Boolean algebras and this we want better. We want the two valued Boolean algebra, no? That's the better semantic for classical logic. So how do we do that? How do we get to this? We define two classes of filters in general. Now, now sorry, now, now it's in I formulated in closure systems, but as we've seen, both filters and theories are special cases of closure systems. So in closure system, a filter is called intersection prime. There are many names for it. We could just say meat irreducible, but uh, as you will see for some some sort of reasons, we will apparent later, it's better to call it intersection prime. If it cannot be written as an intersection of two strictly bigger things. So whenever your closed set is intersection of two other closed sets, then it's actually one of them. There are no two strictly bigger sets which you intersect and you get to it. And completely intersection prime if there is no system which of things which you would intersect and get to get to the to the to the to the closed set you want to get. And we need the notion of basis. Basis, as I already uttered, it, there are many ways how to define a basis. Basis is a subset of a system of closed sets such that each closed set is an intersection of those. Or as is defined here, it is the separation property, which could really remind you the way we prove completeness in logic, no? So whenever we have an element element of the underlying set, which is not in the in the closed set, then there is a system of basis which separates the, the element and the closed set. So you can extend it into an element of the basis, which still doesn't contain the element. No, that's exactly what we do. We extend theory into maximal consistent theory, no? And into the prime theory or whatever. Okay, we have things happening. Yeah, that's pretty weird. And as I said, the Lindemann lemma is uh, when logic is finitary, that complete intersection prime theories form a basis of the of the closure system of all theories. So that's the Lindenbaum lemma for logics. Note the finitarity. Uh, how is the proof? You take you take uh, the usual. Now you take uh, say the extension. How do you extend stuff? You take all the closed sets which are not there, and you want to say that an intersection is what, what you need, and uh, you, you use the Zorn's lemma, no? because you, you, miss, you want to know that if something is not provable in any of the set, it's not provable in the chain of those things, and you unite the chain, and that's how you do it. If you would be provable in the union of the chain, 
because it's finite array, it will be provable from some finite subsets, so it will be provable in one of them. Boom. But if you don't have the finitarity, this will not work. So how can we how can we circumvent it? We get to it. But uh, we need more stuff. What? Carlos doesn't like something? More stuff. Okay. So now is the definition I will not show you. Uh, there is a definition. There is a definition of when the matrix is finitely subdirectly reducible. If you know algebra, you know what it is. If you can read the gray text, you can also read it. But you can also we can use this theorem as a definition for us in this purpose. So when we have a logic and we have a reduced matrix, that uh, the matrix is subdirectly reducible if and only if the filter is completely intersection prime, and it's finitely subdirectly reducible if it is intersection prime. Okay. In classical logic. Uh, if you take, uh, yeah, uh, yes, which which are RSI and RFSI. The RSI in, in classical logic is only the two valued Boolean algebra with the filter being one. No other no other thing would would work. And RFSI these are actually two. This is the two valued and the trivial one, because the trivial one can be seen as reduced is reduced by an empty set. So the 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 trivial one is uh, is always finitely reducible, but not completely reducible because you can use finite set. That's so just a trickery for things being nice. Okay, and we can use it also in our case because if we take this uh, this algebra of standard MV algebra, we know the system of filters is very trivial. Then of course it is intersection prime. No one is intersection prime. It cannot be written as intersection of anything bigger because there is not much things which are bigger. So this is uh, this is RSI. So that's interesting, no? Because uh, you know, we will know why it's interesting uh, only on the next side. That this is uh, this inf l is an example of not finitary logic, which enjoys the third completeness theorem. And what is the third completeness theorem? Is something which says that the logic is complete with respect to its subdirectly reducible matrices. You know, for finitary logics, how we prove it? We have a counterexample. We have a we we have gamma doesn't prove phi. We extend gamma in the complete the intersection prime theory, which still doesn't prove phi, does the extension Linda mom lemma. We are finitary, we can do it. And then we take then we take a matrix of that. And the matrix of that, because the filter is complete intersection prime, is RSI. It's a bit more tricky. You have to show that the after factorization remains true, but perhaps does not go. For finitary logic, you mean the proof, not the result. Yes, that's the point. So the, the first complete theorem, okay, should be proved for finitary logics only, says that the uh, logic. Uh, the every logic is complete, every finitary logic is complete with respect to its RSI matrices. And we even now immediately see that this is not, uh, that this condition is sufficient, but it's not necessary. Because this infinitary Lukashevich logic, of course, is complete with respect to all those RSIs. We don't know how all of them look, but we know that one of them is the standard one and is complete with respect to the standard one. So the this infinitary Lukashevich logic enjoys enjoys this uh, this fact. So that's that's interesting. Okay, now let's go for a tale of three and one ways uh, of not being finitary. I could have said four, but then it would kind of break the symmetry, you know. So, so, so what can what can you? The, the 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 beauty is more important than truth, as we all know. Uh, so we have seen that logic can be RSI complete and not being finitary. Now that was a, that was the, the Lukashevich logic. But maybe also logic can be complete only with respect to the RFSI things, not the RSI, but the RFSI is a bigger set. No, things cannot be finitely reduced. So that's another. But what what have we needed to prove this completeness? To know that each set can be extended into completely intersection prime. No, or for this completeness, we, it would be sufficient to know that each set can be extended into intersection prime. So we have the Linnebaum lemma. Let's make it the property. We say the logic has IPEP, this intersection prime extension property, if intersection prime theory is from a basis. And we say it has SIPEP, completely intersection prime property, when the completely intersection prime field, uh, theories form a basis of the, of the coherent system of all theories. So this is, uh, we know clear, clearly that when logic is finitary, it has all these properties. Because if it's finitary, we have Linden Baum lemma, this is SIPEP. Of course, SIPEP implies IPEP. And of course, SIPEV implies RSI completeness. We have seen this before. You just factorize. Here you just factorize. So this these things definitely look like that. And we have even seen an example of uh, logic which is RSI complete and it's not finitary. So at least some of the arrows <laughs> cannot be conversed. But we have an example that all of the none of the arrows can be can be conversed. So these are really proper for proper extensions of the notion of finitary logic. Each of them strictly bigger. Each of them 
different and is not even trivial because there is a logic which is not even RFSI complete. So the, the class, the, this, this class of RFSI complete logics does not coincide with the class of all logics. So that's also good, you know, not to define trivial notions. I mean, again, sorry, Zan. <laughs> so, uh, yes, where was I? Yes, so we have seen uh, that this hierarchy is not completely trivial. And we will see, and I will show you, that many results, okay, I will not show you as many because I don't have enough uh, time, but I will show you some of the results, which are usually proved for finitary logics, but actually you don't need finitarity. You need some of the consequences of finitarity, typically iPad. But for some cases, you actually need only this, only RFSI completeness, which is a rather particular property. You know, so so these actually are nice, natural. Okay, at least these two are natural. This we can discuss about the naturality, but a relatively nice generalization of uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, class of finitary logics. And there is another thing we will see also that quite often something is proved. For finitary logic, so it's a it's a sufficient condition, but not necessary. But actually, one of these is the sufficient and necessary condition for the property. We will see that. So it's really nice, nice classes. Trust me about it. Uh, let's add a note, but I don't know if I will maybe skip that because how am I doing with time? I started way later than I should. So you still have uh, at least uh, two Okay, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will skip this. I will skip this slide. If you are interested, you can read it. It's it's very easy proof. You know, just easy using the definition of infinitary Lukashevich logic to show that it is sidepath. Okay, I will just show you the beginning. So if we have a uh, if we have a formula which is not in some theory, then it's the, ah it should be I L not the intuitionistic logic. It should be the infinitary Lukashevich. Sorry, I use very similar macro. You know, small i and l and big i and it's not a good idea so there is evaluation which witnesses that and take as the bigger theory the theory of all things which that evaluation sends to one take the pre-image of, of one model of this uh, model of this evaluation this is a bigger theory and it's completely intersection prime because no no bigger theory can do it i will not waste time on this, this is a particular thing but it's it's very easy simple proof so that's this uh so sorry let me go back so the the what was I saying? The infinitary Lukashevich logic has SIPEP. You know, so it has SIPEP, <clears throat> but it also has IPEP. So it kills these two, these two counter arrows. You know, we cannot have that IPEP would imply finitarity or SIPEP would imply finitarity. We know, we know this example. The other examples is bit uh, the other examples showing the, the other separations are a bit more convoluted. One is not so hard, if you know Gadel logic, so Gadel logic with comfortably many constants can be used to kill these arrows. But to kill the final arrows, it's, it's, it's a rather artificial example. Example of logic which is not RFSI complete is not that artificial. I will tell you about it. I will not show you, but I will tell you about it. So setting uh, for for uh, the, for those examples of things which are nicely proved using using the this generalized notion of finitarity, notion of weakly implicative logic. Uh, so logic is weakly implicative, is binary connective, which is reflexive, transitive, enjoys modus ponens. And if you symmetrize the implication, you get a congruence. Generalization of Rashova's uh, implicative logic, which is weakening as an additional, additional, uh, additional condition. Yes, uh, all our all three our logics are clearly weakly implicative. You can easily compute it. We know semantically how it is, so it's easy to see. Uh, why, why what is nice about implicative logics is that in some sense they are logics of order, not in the complete sense, but in some sense. If we have a matrix, uh, so we have an algebra and a filter, we can say that A is less than B with respect to the matrix if and only if the implication is in the filter. Okay? So this this is always a pre-order on any matrix and actually is a characterization of reduced matrices because these are exactly those in which this is ordered. So the ordered, so the reduced matrices of equal implicative logics are naturally ordered. Actually, yeah, this is a bit tricky. And the filter is the upper set. Modus ponens tells you that the filter is upper set with respect to this order. No? So which orders are particularly nice? The linear orders. No? The orders in which two in each two elements are comparable. One is smaller than the other. No? So we call we call such matrices and such filter linear. So there are those in which the, the matrix order is linear. So we call the whole matrix and its filter we call linear. And we use this uh, mod L to denote all those logics. And now there comes the definition of semilinear logics. Logic is semilinear if and only if it's complete with respect to its linearly ordered matrices. 
classical logic is a wonderful seminar logic. The infinitary Lukashevich logic is, is seminar, of course, because it's complete respect to one particular matrix. Yeah, because this one particular matrix, of course, is linearly ordered. The implication works like that. Uh, we have uh, uh, in Lukashevich logic in the semantics, X implies Y is one if and only if X is less or equal than one. So always one of them is the case. So it's always one of them is one. Filter is being one. So this is a similar logic uh, to show the same for the for the finitary uh, finitary companion and for then for and particularly for this infinitary extension by the by the Hay rule is much more work. We will get to it. Uh, this is, by the way, this was uh, uh, my and Carla's attempt to capture the notion of fuzzy logic. It's like separate fuzzy logics from other non-classical logics as a defining feature being completely with respect to chains and containing the, the extreme case of classical logic. Joke. <laughs> yeah, R RM also. But so, uh, I remember the story. I was giving this talk somewhere, uh, somewhere in Poland, and then uh, Mike, Mike, Mike Dunn was there and... Uh, I think uh, Arnon Avron and one of them approached the other and say, "Ah, this guy said that the relevant logic with Mingle is fuzzy. That's terrible." <laughs> <laughs> because RM is complete with respect to an error of the RL matrices. Okay, so let's forget about that and let me show you one particular correct theorem, which is uh, ugly, or looks ugly, but it's not ugly. It's very nice. Uh, now for finitary logics. No? If the logic is finitary, we have these properties. Being semilinear, so complete respect to chains, is the same as that linear theories are the basis of the system of all theories. Is the same that we have a similarity property. This is kind of nice, simple syntactical characterization. No, just saying that, just saying that whenever you prove something from one implication and from the other, you have this. It's quite easy to see now. If logic is semilinear, you have a linear counterexample. So use this counterexample by the same trick I have used to find the pre-image by the evolution. This will be the linear linear theory, which will extend your theory. To get from this to this is also obvious. Imagine gamma doesn't prove chi. Take the linear extension of gamma, which doesn't prove chi. And because it's linear, one of them must be the case. So it's extension of this or this. It kills one of these two premises. So it's obvious, no? What is not obvious is to get to from 3 to 4a. I, I use this weird numbering for reasons apparent on the next slide. Uh, to get, this is tricky. This is basic. If you look at this, what is this? This is like version of the same thing but not, say, syntactic, but for arbitrary algebra. This is so-called transferred version of the similarity property. And this is something abstract algebraic logic likes to prove, that you have some property which is true syntactically for the logic, and you transfer this property to the to, to, to arbitrary algebras. You know, so, so that's, that's, that's this version. This allows us to prove that linear filters coincide with intersection prime. And this is important, as I always say that, the original in the mom lemma gives you that completely intersection prime are basis. Also, the completely intersection prime are the interesting one. But when then you go for a bit more other, say, particular syntactical characterization of that in certain setting of this notion of primeness, uh, it actually turns out that you can characterize the finite one instead of the, the infinite one, which is perhaps not surprising because we use the finitary language usually is finite. In particular, of course, we will need the primeness using this junction. So whenever you prove this junction, you prove one of the disjoints, no? But here we have uh, another another characterization of intersection primeness is in the form of linearity. You prove one of the implications. You can imagine it in classical logic, you prove phi or non-phi, as the completeness, no, of a theory, which of course here it doesn't work, but in, in classical logic, it's another, another characterization, even of completely intersection prime in that case, because as we know, classical logic is degenerated, so everything everything works there. When linear filters coincide with intersection prime filters, then because the logic is finitary to start with, of course, then we have RFSI completeness. And if uh, the, the linear ones are the, the, sub, uh, the intersection prime one, then of course we have this equality because this is, uh, no, yeah, sorry. Yeah, we have this equality because all RFSIs are the linear ordered ones. So that's nice because this tells you that the linear ordered matrices are not some ad hoc defined. No, they are intrinsically defined as the RFSI matrices, which are completely intrinsically defined for, for a given logic. And in particular, it also means that RSI are some of the chains. That's the usual way people were proving it in fuzzy logics. I even heard somebody saying, uh, saying it wrongly the other day, that subdirectly irreducible, that the chains, all chains are subdirectly irreducible. This need not be the case. All chains are finitely subdirectly irreducible. There is only the subset here. Okay, so that was the proof which needed finitarity for all, they get all this equivalence, no? 
now how it will work in the more general setting. So the equivalence of the first two things is still the same. This is always the case. But to get some linearity, you will always get some linearity. In any similar logic, you get some linearity property. But to go back, you don't need finitarity. You need IPEP. So the IPEP is necessary and sufficient condition for equivalence of similarity and similar property. So actually, that's nice because it also tells you that all similar logics have IPEP. So every logic, every fuzzy logic, every similar logic, which is infinitary, is an example of separation of IPEP and finitarity. So they all of them has, has the IPEP. All of them enjoys the Nimbaum lemma for prime instead of complete intersection prime. So this is exactly what you need. And what we need for the other things is the RFSI completeness. So RFSI completeness plus any of the other three properties is equivalent with similarity. So, and the final thing, final thing we cannot add completely equivalently. This is only if we assume RSI completeness, we get we get this uh, we get uh, this five. But we don't have to have that each similar logic is RSI complete. This need not happen. So this is not as beautiful as it could be. But I still think it's pretty beautiful. No. Uh, that we get we get from this thing, which has a very strong assumption of finitarity, to complete characterizations without any assumptions with the we identified what are the properties, what is exactly missing there to get the equivalence. So that's beautiful, at least in my book. Okay, now we can prove that Lukashevich logic is similar. That's very easy because we use the similarity property. It's it's a finitary logic, so we can use it. We know that whenever we, this is provable, then there is some finite subset which is that is provable in the infinitary one. Of course, there are two finite subsets, but we unite them. We have one finite subset. So the similarity property of infinitary look, which we know it has, that's you know because it always is a similar logic, so it has similarity property. We have the we have this, and then we can go back. Okay, so that's that's easy uh, for Lukashevich logic. For hey Lukashevich logic, still some work is needed. And what we will need to prove it, uh, I guess there are many ways, but I will show you proof using these junctions. Because if there is some problem in logic, there is usually a solution using this junction. OK, that was a very strong statement. <laughs> no, no, no. So three kinds of this junction. Everything comes in triplets in this talk. So uh, we have three kinds of this junction. Weak disjunction is a connective, which enjoys this, what we call proto disjunction property. It just means that. This junction is bigger, you know, directively bigger than the than the thing, or weaker actually directively than, than the formula itself. So phi or psi or phi or psi falls on phi or psi. And we have the weak proof by cases property. Weak in the sense there are no additional premises. Okay, so either phi proves high or psi proof. If phi proves high and psi proves high, then there this junction proves high. When we have this notion of weak disjunction, uh, the, all the things uh, you would expect are true, like I don't know, weird form of distributivity, uh, idempotency of this junction, con, uh, the what's this thing? Thank you, commutativity, and so on. So that's 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 easy. Uh, we omit the prefix weak if it holds with arbitrary arbitrary context. So whenever yeah, when arbitrary context in uh, let me just tell you, there is a finitary logic which has a weak disjunction but has no disjunction. It can be quite easily easily constructed. So uh, these are different notions. And final notions is the notion of strong disjunction. And look what weird thing is happening. Here we are disjointing one element, phi and psi, and we take their disjunction. No? Strong disjunction, we disjoint. We have two sets, potentially infinite, and we do all possible disjunction. It's quite easy to see if we are finitary. We can mimic this by using finitely many of this, but not in general. It's the same situation as with cut. Infinitary logics, we can you know, use finitely many simple cuts to get the proper cut. Here is the same, but we are not finitary, it's not the same. So infinitary logics is this junction is strong, but not vice versa. And uh, yes, and more facts. Uh, the normal disjunction is a strong disjunction at infinitary Lukashevich logic. You just compute with once, it's quite easy to see. I don't have time to tell you, but trust me. So it is by the same logic we get from similarity of infinitary look to look, we get the strong PCP, strong proof by cases as PCP. Again, for Hay logic, it will be some work. Uh, to wake you up a little bit, uh, it need not uh, just so you don't know, um, so you see it's not obvious, because not everything you disjoin as disjunction is a disjunction in this sense. For example, take a global S4 
in global S4, we have phi implies box phi or non phi, of course. We have uh, the, the, you know, I said global S5. So we have phi gives box phi. So it gets this and non phi gets this. So by proof by case is this, blah, blah, blah. Phi implies box phi, collapse of modalities. Okay. So in, so the normal disjunction, the lattice connective disjunction is not a proper disjunction of global, global S4. But what is, is this box phi or non box psi. This is a proper disjunction in in S4. So, yeah, sorry. So these junctions are tricky. And what's so beautiful about this, uh, that this junction interplay with implication, so we get to the to the problem of implication via this junction, because the, this infinitary case, this notion of strong PCP, is very nicely and easily characterizable. Characterizable. Okay, whatever. So when we have a logic with some axiomatization, that something is strong disjunction, if and only if we have this trivial fact, so commutativity, idempotency, and say monotony, if you wish. And for each rule, if you take or high to all the premises and you get or high to the conclusion, you get still something which is drivable. So there is a very easy characterization how to get how to get uh, how to get this. Okay, now and now we use this fact to prove that. This junction is a strong disjunction in Hey Lukashevich logic, which is a tricky logic. It is an infinitary rule. You know how you prove things in infinitary rules. So we observe that it's a strong disjunction. We know it's a strong disjunction in the Lukashevich logic itself. We use these two trickeries. This is basically just uh, weakening. No, high gives you high. This n means this n conjunction. So I, I don't have time to go through details. But it's really just this one simple step which gives us this. And then when we have all these premises. Then we actually have all these premises, and we use the Hay rule for this uh, phi or chi, so we get phi or chi. It's very easy proof in three steps, which unfortunately I don't have time to go into details. So the hey lukashevich logic is an example of non-finitary logic with strong disjunction. Okay. So, uh, and this is a similar characterization, what we have seen for, uh, for similarity. Uh, here is for different disjunction. So uh, the filter is this junction prime in the usual way. No, whenever it proves this junction, it proves one of the disjoints. So this junction prime filters, and uh, and uh, when the disjunction prime filters form a basis of the system of all theories. So that was the the, the notion of similarity. Again, again, finitarity would give us equivalence of everything. But again, we characterize what exactly is happening. So if it has IPEP, then is equivalent with disjunction, strong disjunction. Intersection prime filters coincide with the disjunction prime filters and so on. What is interesting in RFSI complete, so IPEP and any of this, and uh, ah, sorry, yeah, this is a nah, nah, slide. This, uh, sorry, there is a there is a small mistake. This could this should not be here. That's that's more tricky. But uh, yeah, no, nah, ah, damn it. I have to I have to correct this slide later. But it's not important. Uh, let's ignore this for a moment. But look three and four. So. Uh, RFSI complete and strong disjunction. And if it's weakly implicative, then actually RFSI complete and disjunction. So if we have a weakly implicative logic, which is a disjunction which is not strong, is an example of logic which is not RFSI complete. So this is an example that the biggest class of generalization of finitary logic is actually not everything. Okay? And this can be found very easily. Take a hating algebra, which is a frame, there are frames, but not the dual frame. And define the logic of this particular algebra, and you get you get an extension, you get something on RFSI complete. Okay, now we are getting close to, to getting close to the end of the of the third tail, and uh, we need this. This is the variant of Lindenbaum lemma for certain infinitary logics. So this is a big new result in a way that if you have a logic with strong disjunction and a countable presentation, then it has the IPEP. So it means that whenever you doesn't prove something, there is a prime theory. Now prime in the sense either intersection prime or in the sense disjunction prime. So extending theories into prime theories works even without presence of finitarity, as long as you are countably axiomatizable and you have a strong disjunction. So that's a that's a strong result. The next tale in our ontology will be all about uh, about this result. Okay. Uh, now let me just tell you how we use this. So we, we get to this, we get back to this, but let's just now skip of the interplay of this junction implication. Uh, these two 
probably familiar. This is familiar for fuzzy people. Now this is the so-called prevenarity. Phi implies psi or psi implies phi. And uh, clearly this holds, you know, similar logics, no? And uh, this is so-called, uh, it's kind of half of the disjunction version of modus ponens. So phi implies psi and this disjunction give you psi. So this is true whenever this is disjunction, no? Because one part is modus ponens and the other part is just psi implies psi. Then you use the, 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 the PCP. What is interesting that this condition tells you that all prime filters are linear. And the other condition tells you that all linear filters are intersection. Sorry, disjunction uh, prime should be disjunction. It's a mistake. So this 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 kind of this rules translate one notion of primeness to the other notion of primeness and vice versa. And in particular, we have weakly implicative logic with a condition which has this trivial disjunction property. Just phi gives you phi or psi, and this MP disjunction and the P disjunction uh, preliminarity. Then semilinearity is equivalent to being a disjunction and having an IPEP. Okay, not no finitarity needed, similarity and IPEP. And using this previous thing, because we know that we in the previous slide we have seen that we can get IPEP in certain particular uh, tricky condition, and then we have this weak implicative logic with countable presentation and disjunction satisfying some trivial stuff is similar if and only if disjunction is strong. So to proving similarity is equivalent to proving strongness of a disjunction. Now we can use this to complete the circle and show that infinitary Lukashevich logic is actually the same as high Lukashevich logic. I will be using some algebraic knowledge, but we can skip that. So we know that uh, the high Lukashevich logic is countably axiomatizable. It has a strong disjunction. We have proved that. So it has the IPEP. So we can extend everything into a prime theory. Now we look, we know it's similar, error, but actually we don't need this. We need a bit more. We know the linebaum tarski algebra of uh, of a prime theory is we, it gives us a simple chain. Uh, this uh, is due to the infinitary rule. Basically, simply tells us that yeah, uh, that there is only only everything or or nothing. So, sorry, just singleton one or or everything are the only filters there. Nothing else could be there because of the the. As I told you this, if you multiply this phi, you get zero at some moment. And if you cannot, but if you would have infinitesimals, we have seen the talk in the previous. Previous conference, somebody was using Chenk algebra. No, the MV algebra which is infinitesimals and co-infinitesimals. This could be used to kill the Hay rule because then if you go in infinite co-infinitesimals and conjunct, you stay co-infinitesimal. So then, then this is a, this is actually a way to show that Hay rule is not true in in, in general. Uh, but but here we get that it's a simple MV chain, and we use algebraic knowledge that all simple MV chains can be embedded into into the standard MV chain. That's so algebraic knowledge. It's a consequence of Helder's theorem from from the theory of vector spaces, and uh, so we know that if we have the counterexample in this standard, uh, so we know that we have a counterexample in this particular particular matrix uh, with standard MV algebra. So it's not provable in the infinitary logic. So really, infinitary Lukashevich logic is axiomatized. By using this infinitary Hay rule, and the only only algebraic knowledge here we need is this embeddability of uh, simple MV algebras, and we change, uh, yeah, into zero one. Good. So that was uh, the end of the third tale. And now I don't know. You seem tired. I seem tired. So I will tell. I will take the the fourth tale a little bit faster. Uh, I will just, uh, you can then look at the slides and read it if you want. So this variant of infinite uh, of uh, Lindenbaum lemma for some infinitary logics was formulated with two assumptions, strong disjunction and countable presentation. There are quite easy counterexamples showing you cannot omit that. So this is an example of logic which is countably axiomatizable, but doesn't have IPEP. So it means it cannot have strong disjunction. And this is an example of logic which has a strong disjunction because we basically use this nabla form thing. So we know it has a strong disjunction. Sorry, this particular forms of rules. So we get uh, we get logic with strong disjunction, but not countable presentation, which doesn't, in which IPEP, uh, IPEP fails. So both these conditions, we cannot, we generalize that, but we cannot go on in generalizing in this direction. We can generalize in completely another direction, perhaps. But in this direction, these two conditions cannot be cannot be omitted. They are not, of course, equivalent. They are not necessary, but uh, it cannot be omitted from the proof from this lemma. Good. Uh, now, let's uh, 
let's uh, me tell you how it is proved a little bit no because i think the proof is interesting uh, it's 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 interesting to see it and uh, let's connect it to the notion of uh, logic with multiple conclusions so let us ignore structurality for now on okay so so logic would be a relation between sets of formulas and formulas monotonicity reflexivity cut and uh, m logic is the relation between sets of formulas and sets of formulas again reflexivity again monotony but what is there what is what should be their use instead of cut in the in the the mike dunn and uh, no the g was the the dunn 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 hard g book about uh, about algebraic logic you can find that this is a proper way you have to use in multi-conclusion logic to to get uh, what is a proper version of cut and what does this say it, it, it sorry it looks it looks confusing at the first but it's used this terminology we say that the tuple tuple of sets of formulas is a pair if uh, with respect to the given logic if delta is not a consequence of of, of gamma and it is a full pair if uh, each formula is either on the left or on the right so it's a, like pair you can see pair as a consistent description of a situation and this is a complete consistent description of a situation okay and pair extends another pair the usual way just make both things bigger no and what this says is actually, if you read it contrapositively, it's a pair extension property. It says whenever you have a pair, whenever gamma doesn't doesn't entail delta, then there must be some way to split all remaining formulas between the premises and conclusion such that it's also not provable. So each pair can be extended into complete pair, a full pair. So this is a pair extension property. You may ask, what about cuts? The simple cut rule, just the simple cut rule in the multi-conclusion setting, uh, would not work. It would work only if you are both left finitary and right finitary. Okay. Here you have, we have to be careful because we have two finitarities. No, the left and the right. They need not imply each other in general setting. What is more interesting would be the strong cut. Look at the strong cut. This is uh, again analogy of the strong cut from the from the uh, the the one conclusion says. So this means whenever gamma with some phi proves some delta and we can and gamma proves this delta with arbitrary phi from this big phi from the capital phi. It is true for all those phi's. Then we can cut the set phi away and get gamma proves delta. This is so called strong cut property, and uh, it is implied. It is implied by prime extension property. It's quite easy to see, but it does not is not equivalent. I think in Mike's book there will be a counterexample. I'm not certain, but uh, you can find a counterexample. We will see in our setting, it actually is different, but uh, in, in the general setting, it's different. Uh, it's a different setting, so it's different notions. How do we get, how does it help us? So how this multi-conclusion stuff helps us? We take our logic, our single conclusion stuff, and we use the disjunction to define symmetrization in the way you would expect. We say gamma proves delta in the multi-conclusion set if there is some finite subset such that gamma proves this junction of this delta proofs in the original single conclusion logic. Okay, that's one of the possible reductions. There are many. This reduction, of course, has the right finitarity built in. No, because whenever you prove some delta, you prove some finite subset of it. So the right finitarity is built in, but that's fine. So uh, this we have. The question is, if this if this logic, if this M logic, if this is the multi-conclusion logic, if it's a finitary one. So, uh, okay. Of course, we have reflexivity, monotony, right finitarity, that's obvious. Left finitarity is equivalent to the normal finitarity of the underlying logic L, but what about prime extension property? So let us explore it and why it is relevant for us because of this reason. Whenever this gamma and delta is a, is a full pair and the disjunction is actually this junction, not just weak, but this junction, then gamma is a prime theory. So in the full pairs, this is to become a prime theory. Of course, imagine, imagine that uh, gamma doesn't prove phi and doesn't prove psi. And because this is a full pair, then phi and psi are in delta. So then gamma cannot prove their disjunction because if it proves their disjunction, then this would not be a pair. This would mean gamma proves delta. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's clear. So uh, um, yes, so PEP, the prime extension property implies Lindenbaum lemma, implies this this iPad. No, because of course, they just take if gamma doesn't prove phi, then take gamma and the singleton of phi. That's a pair, and it can be extended to full pair. And then the gamma prime is the prime theory because of this. That's the prime theory we're looking for. We are in the presence of this junction, so we don't have to say what prime means. It means that or that. Doesn't matter. 
Actually, we don't need a full PAP. We don't need a prime, the full pair extension property. It would be enough to have it for deltas being singletons. But of course, if you think about it for a second, if we have it for delta being singletons, we have it for deltas being finite. So that's a more natural property because you just combine it by this junction. And more interestingly, if gamma is a prime theorem and we take all the rest, then we get a full pair. That's also nice, no? So when we have a prime theorem, means this kind of full description, is already a full description of the world because the all the rest can be put there. And of course, it cannot prove any finite disjunction, no? That's, as I said, because of the, the finitarity, the right finitarity is built in. So how does it help us? It helps us by this. Logic is IPEP. But we are looking for the Lindenbaum bomb lemma. No, this one I'm trying to prove. If and only if it has pair extension property for finite deltas. Okay, now I think it's time to do a rotation. Ah. So what's the situation? PEP for finite deltas is equivalent with IPEP. So this we have seen. Good. Uh, let us explore cuts. Uh, this logic always have the simple cut, the way we define it. It's very easy to see. I will not go into details. Okay, now I can use this. And PEP implies strong cut. The pair extension property implies we have a strong cut. This is true in general, but it's true in this particular setting. So we know PEP implies strong cut. Okay, let's use a nicer arrows. And is the same if we have it only for finite deltas. Okay, that's also true. Of course, PEP implies PEP for finite deltas and strong cut implies strong cut for finite deltas. That's obvious. And what is interesting, again, now linking the multi-conclusion world with the single conclusion, strong cut for finite deltas is equivalent with strong proof by cases property. So this was the, the fact that the disjunction is a strong disjunction. Okay, so we have this. Okay, I will not, I don't have time now to go through any more details. But what is interesting that in this setting, but again, I'm stressing in this setting, because this setting has the, the right finitarity built in, strong cut actually implies finitarity of the underlying logic L. So strong cut implies finitarity. And finitarity implies PEP in this particular in this particular setting, you know, because we have cut always for granted. Cut is because the way we constructed the multi-conclusion from the single conclusion. This all picture is in the world when the multi-conclusion logic are coming from the single conclusion one, the way I define them, okay? Again, I don't have time to go through it, but it's a very nice, uh, nice, neat, simple proof. The use the use of a strong cut on a, on a particular proper infinitary rule, funny substitution, and we would get a contradiction with the fact that there is a proper infinitary rule. That's kind of neat. Uh, so to put it together, if we have a disjunction and uh, the multi-conclusion logic is defined the way it is, finite, PEP, strong cut, and finitarity are equivalent. So these three things are, are equivalent. Okay. And what we have not proved yet, we have almost proved, would be we know that IPEP is equivalent with pair extension for finite. We know that strong cut is equivalent to having a strong disjunction, but if we have a countable presentation, we can go back. We can go from SPCP to, to, to IPEP. So count press. This is what we were wanted, no? What we wanted is, in the, if we have a countable presentation and strong disjunction, then we have IPEP. That's our goal forever. I mean, forever, for this for tale, no? to prove four implies one. But because we know these are equivalent, we know these are equivalent. So actually, instead of proving this, which is relatively hard, we prove three implies two. That strong cut for finite deltas implies per extension. So it's interesting for two reasons. First is the proof strategy. And second, it's interesting to have per extension property because model logicians and some relevant logicians, some people like that. You know, so it's nice to know we, we have it, but only for finite. We cannot have it in general because in general it would imply finitarity. So everything would collapse. So that's also nice, but finitary. I don't know. I think I will skip the proof because, but I started pretty late, right? Started, uh, I mean, I I'm still, no, no, I will, <laughs> I will, I will, I will skip the proof. I will only show you. Okay. Just, just, I will tell you, okay. I will only tell you the construction. 
So we construct increasing sequence of pairs, as you would expect, no? And the point is, if we can add a formula, the, no, the, the important thing is we enumerate all the rules we have. That's why we need the axiomatic system to be countable. So we enumerate all the rules. And then we look at each rule and say, can we consistently add its conclusion to the, to the premises? You know, will this, so gamma i, delta i is a pair. Can we add the conclusion of the rule and still be a pair? If we can do it, let's do it. And if we cannot do it, there has to be one of the premises we can use to, we can add to the delta, to the things which should not be true. And the way why this is just the one easy use of strong cut for finite deltas, because it uh, doesn't matter. Now this actually would work in general, but uh, then we will get pep for the deltas. So so that's the so the trick really is, the trick here is, any rule I could use in proving things, I either add its conclusion to the things I consider true, or I will block myself from ability to use it by saying one of its premises is not true. I mean, not, not you know, in delta, in the kind of forbidden set, you know? And then, then we can use this. We can prove this claim that if we construct gamma prime as uniting of all the gammas and delta prime uniting all the deltas, then gamma gamma prime has kind of built infinitarity. You know? If gamma prime proves psi, then it is there, it got there in one of the sets. You know, this is this, the proof by the by the induction over the complexity of the proof, not, not complicated, but, uh, but, but neat, I would say. And when we have that, what remains to prove that this this tuple is actually a pair? It's quite easy to see uh, that to make to make it finite. This is done by using this dummy rule. We can assume we have rule psi implies psi. So when we process this rule, we either add psi to the premises or to the conclusion. So so the fullness of the pair is trivial, and the fact that it's a pair, it's you know really simple use of the of the induction hypothesis and the fact that proving something means proving it uh, belonging to some finite uh, finite part of it. Okay, so that's the main proof. Let me just quickly go through epilogue of the whole story. And it's, we don't need this junction. We don't need, <laughs> we don't need this junction uh, completely. And we don't need structurality. We can prove this as the same level of abstraction as we have seen it in the abstract minimum lemma. So assume, uh, and the trick is, this is the way we define it. The trick is, we define this uh, this uh, consequence, uh, the symmetrized consequence, as saying that this junction is provable. But if we have weak disjunction, then this, the theory genera generated by this junction is intersection of these two theories. And of course, this proving this means that theory generated by that is a subset of theory generated by that. But if theory generated by that is intersection of the theory indivi by individual, we can define it without use this junction by this way. So there is a finite set that if we intersect the theories generated by the finitely many things, it will be subset of theory generated by gamma. So this is uh, this is a way which doesn't need this junction. If we have the disjunction, it's the same. We don't we don't have it. It doesn't even need structurality. Now these things could be arbitrary things, you know, arbitrary elements of some causal system. But what is needed? What is needed is that intersection of two finitely generated theories is finitely generated. Okay, this we have here. Of course, this junction have this. This is the intersection of two, this can be generalized. Uh, not completely, but it can be generalized in the presence of the second condition we need, which is that the lattice of theories is a frame. No, it's not only distributive lattice, it's a frame. It has this, this infinitary distributivity. And this is interesting because that's actually one of the characterization of strong disjunction. Strong disjunction is a disjunction which has the lattice of theories uh, is a frame. So this is one of the equivalent conditions to, for a disjunction to be strong. These junctions are strong if the lattice of theories is a frame. So again, this is something which if we have the strong PCP, we have a strong disjunction, we have this notion. The logic is frame. So if we have a logic with strong disjunction, it has both these properties. So, and now I will only skip this because that's not important. Yeah, we can show, no, no, I really have to skip this. I will only show you the lemma. So the lemma, Structurally, it was formulated like that. We have logic, countable presentation, strong disjunction. Then we can extend things into prime theories. And the abstract notion is, if we have a logic, if we have a consequence relation, so arbitrary closure system, which has a countable, okay, a countable, <laughs> funny uh, autocorrect, I guess, which has a countable presentation. It's a, <laughs> it is a frame. The lattice of closed set is a frame. And the intersection of two finitely generated theories, closed sets, if you wish, is, is, is finitely generated. 
then the Lindenbaum lemma holds. So that's a proper generalization of Lindenbaum lemma for the closed uh, closure systems. And again, you can look at the slides uh, uh, if you would be interested to see where exactly the two properties are proved. The primality is proved to get the strong cut and the finite generation is to use to get the final contradiction, uh, in which is the same in the proof of the, of, the, of the particular case. And let us end with some propaganda. If you want to know more, read this book. Buy this book, you can probably download it, but you can also buy it. Uh, we don't get any money out of it, so don't worry. I'm not saying it to get more money. I'm just telling you to read it to get more readers. Okay, thank you for your attention.